Bird, you like that? <laughs> Any discrepancy? Uh, we're up. Yeah. Hey, everybody, I think we're going to get going. Uh, the mayor is going to be here, but he's in Rome. He said he's running a few minutes late, so uh, um, my goal is to run us in and out of this meeting in one and a half hours. There is quite a bit of ground to cover. Um, I'm going to apologize. There's quite a few things we're going to cover. We maybe only spend 10 or 15 minutes on each one, but that's the goal. If you have not been in this building, uh, this is the Jefferson EMS wing. The restrooms are out that door. Turn left, walk up the hallway. Uh, men's and women's are up 25 paces or so if, if you have to excuse yourself. Please uh, help yourself to some water, soda, cookies. The more you take, the less there is to clean up. So um, with that, I'm going to ask Mary to take the roll call. I will say this is uh, a joint meeting notice of the Common Council, the Planning Commission, and the Jefferson Redevelopment Authority. Adams? Here. Mendel? Farrell? Here. Nash? Here. Opperman? Miller? Here. Vandenberg? Krause? Yes. Tony? Here. Fire? Randall? Here. Horn? Here. Larris? Peachy? Here. McAllis? Dupree? Yes. Herner King? Here. Stevens? Here. Pinnell? Which one? Jen? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Are we good? So the last time we had one of these meetings, we talked uh, about some of these projects we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to give you updates. Um, the topics that we will discuss tonight, I would expect uh, to occur in 2019, and some are very complex. Uh, they may not be completed, but I would expect that uh, substantial progress will be made on them. Um, so, as I said, we're going we're gonna to take you through this uh, really, really quickly. Uh, this is really a good meeting for us to uh, chat about this because on some of these projects we are nearing the, the start to spend money phase. And uh, I would guess that by the time we're done you're probably going to say there's stuff going on uh, really in every section of the city from north to south to east to west. And uh, some of these projects probably are pretty substantially important to the future direction of uh, of the community and uh, so with that uh, we're going to start uh, talking about uh, a project we last discussed in September. Uh, the area uh, in the red uh, boundary uh, was discussed as a potential uh, tax increment district. It would be tax increment district number nine. It would encompass a couple of hundred acres generally up in the northeast area of the community. Um, it includes uh, an expansion of the city's North Industrial Park. Most of you are aware that uh, the North Industrial Park has no saleable lots. The last two were sold in 2018 to Ron McDermott and uh, Staling's Taxidermist. Those buildings uh, are either completed or nearing completion. So the city has no saleable industrial lots. The proposal is to expand the North Industrial Park to the north. Uh, on uh, Phase one would be on the southerly most portion of 100 acres that the city owns. The other portion of the tax increment district that is proposed is up in the northwest corner of that red boundary, and that is the area around the State Highway 26 bypass north interchange. Bill, you can advance us. We did talk about uh, um, that North Interchange project in September. Uh, at that time, we were talking about construction of a gas station. Since that time, uh, there is an investment group that has come forward that is interested in uh, parlaying uh, a 51 uh, room hotel on that site adjacent to where the gas station would be constructed. Um, that is the cell tower site. If you're up around that north interchange, there's a cell tower located on the very uh, northern part of the uh, property. <coughs> um, that is the site plan that was shared with the town and council. Oh, it was several weeks ago by the developers. That property has closed. The closing took place 
uh, last week, Friday. Uh, a fair amount of things would, would have to happen probably the first quarter of 2019, including uh, a number of local improvals. Uh, there would be need for a land division, a certified survey map, site plan reviews, conditional use permits on both uh, the uh, gas station and on the hotel project. Of the two, I would say the gas station is uh, a little farther ahead than the hotel, but uh, the investor group has been assembled. Uh, when they chatted with the Common Council, uh, they had talked about 51 room mid-scale hotel. They identified the brand <coughs> as either being a Best Western or a Wyndham, uh, Wingate uh, product. Uh, the gas station is a BP gas station. I think that's pretty much set. Uh, those are the directions those projects are going. Uh, the goal for the gas station is to break ground on that site uh, in late spring, early summer, uh, and then the hotel would follow. So um, the uh, other part of, uh, of uh, the tax increment district is that color shaded area. We're going to focus on the green area. That would be uh, the first phase of the expansion of the North Industrial Park. Bill is going to talk a little bit about that. Um, previously, we had talked about um, needing that property to uh, facilitate a local transaction. Uh, we have one user that's interested in a lot, that is Highway Landscapers. They're located just off Collins Road, just to the north of Basin Manufacturing. And the discussion was that Basin would buy their property for their own plant expansion and then highway landscapers would relocate to a lot that would be created with this first phase uh, of uh, the North Industrial Park um, addition. Uh, that is all very uh, uh, alive. Um, we met as recently as a week or so ago. Nothing's been reduced to, to writing, but there is a gentleman's agreement that, you know, should the city uh, create uh, additional industrial lots in that green shaded area. Lot one would be the lot that highway landscapers would relocate to. And so if we move the project forward, I would say the first five or six months of 2019 is when we would try to put that agreement between the city highway landscapers and basin uh, manufacturing in place. I'm going to turn it over to you, Bill. You can describe very, very quickly um, uh, what that expansion really encompasses. Sure. So this is the extension of North Parkway. Um, on the south side is, is essentially uh, Generac. Um, the extension of North Parkway will eventually reach Dewey. Uh, what we're talking about in 2019 is getting about halfway there. Uh, we've identified an approximate point uh, where a road would eventually extend through. These lots are approximate at this point. Uh, some, of the, some of the items that are gonna be dictating exactly where those lots are gonna be is gonna be grading, uh, wetlands and things like that. And obviously what lot sizes uh, we potentially wanna look at there. Um, the overall road extension is about 1,200 feet. Uh, we anticipate going about halfway um, or is, is what our budget allows next year. We've set aside about a million dollars to extend uh, that roadway um, to that point uh, for next year. And we've got a few challenges to work around with that. Uh, right now, utilities are extended to the existing North Parkway end, uh, just north of Generac. Uh, the extension here would involve water, sanitary, storm sewer, uh, power, um, up through that point. Eventually the water we would anticipate looping um, around, but that's going to be future phases. Um, the area to the west of that roadway we have identified as uh, wetland. We we're aware that it was wetland. We had a wetland determination done earlier this year. Uh, the extents of that uh, reached a little further east than we anticipated, so the alignment of this road is going to change slightly. Uh, we're currently in the process uh, because of the fact that we're past the growing season. Uh, we won't be getting that delineation concurrence from WDNR until um, more than likely um, the spring. There's a possibility we could get a winter concurrence, but more than likely that will be the spring. Um, so I'm anticipating the alignment is going to change slight, slightly. 
whether or not we're going to have to do some permitting. It's likely we're going to have to do some wetland fill. So again, we're working through that process. Um, as far as what the timing of this project looks like, um, December and January, we are, ex we are anticipating that we're going to be doing the engineering design. Town and Country Engineering um, is going to be the uh, design engineer for us. Um, they are essentially going to be doing the uh, plan profile for the roadway alignment as well as the grading of the lots um, in that area to be able to grade, uh, to be able to make them uh, ready for the first development. Uh, February through April essentially is going to be the project bidding award and within that time frame is the uh, wetland permitting. Again, that is a I went through this with the we went through this with the council last week, but it is a very tight time frame. Everything kind of has to align to be able to get these things in place. But we've got a plan at this point. Um, once the wetland permitting is determined, uh, we'll be able to verify the road alignment, and then we'll be able to do the platting. Uh, likely through, we'll probably just do a four lot CSM initially uh, to be able to get the first phase through there. And then we're anticipating a June through November site grading and street utility construction. So be a lot of activity up in that area. At this point, we do have the topographic survey of the area done. Um, so we'll start moving on those things. But it'll be a certainly a busy, busy uh, design and construction season in that area in 2019. Anything else, Tim? Nope, that's good. Um, where we left off when we uh, talked in September jointly, as this group uh, did, is uh, to create a tax increment district. That process really starts with uh, financial feasibility analysis. Uh, our work is all done, our TID work is all done by Ellers and Associates. Uh, Dawn Gunderson is here tonight. Uh, Dawn, come on up. And uh, she's going to talk briefly about the results of that uh, feasibility study. That's step one. Uh, if that looks good, step two really is to take that concept, move it into the statutory process to create a tax increment district. So that's where we would go after tonight's discussion. Uh, that would take us through the end of this month, January and into February to uh, get that district put in place. So with that, I'm going to introduce Dawn Gunderson. Thank you. Excuse me. Um, I realize you can't read these numbers, and I don't expect that uh, you need to at this point, but I'll kind of walk you through what these schedules are. As Tim mentioned, the town council engaged us to do the initial feasibility um, analysis of, the, of this. So what we have done is we've taken the project costs that have been provided to us by staff um, for not only the initial phase, but the future phases of this development, as well as uh, Van de Waal, um, the planners that have worked with the city um, in the past, provided us with some uh, development potential for the area and some um, absorption of that development over a period of the life of the district. And um, what we've done then is taken those numbers and, and evaluated if the potential for that development is able to pay for the cost. Keeping in mind that we've staged this so that the village is not going out or the city is not going out there and just spending a lot of money, probably like the original industrial park was done where you put in the roads and the sewer and then you wait for the development to happen. This will be staged that the construction cost um, or any project cost will go into place about the time that anticipation for development is. So this first phase here, and these will be schedules that if you do choose to move forward with the project plan that you would actually see in that document. And this is the project costs that have been put together by staff. It's been broken out in phases. The phase one is the 2019 project cost, which is roughly 1.7 million. And as, as Bill mentioned, it includes some uh, sanitary sewer, water, storm sewer, and some street um, improvements. There's also, we've identified uh, potential developments and development incentives for the development on the north end of this district, if, if negotiations uh, show that there's need for that, then um, that, that would be an eligible project cost and we've identified it in this and um, the ability to support that. The second phase would be the extension of the initial streets in the industrial park, and then the third phase is timed out a little farther where you go to the north end of that, um, the, the uh, industrial piece of the, the development. Then we've identified some ongoing costs, the administrative expenses that help defray any costs that the city has to keep the district running. It could be staff costs, it's auditing fees, so on and so forth. And then there's a few projects that would um, 
perhaps necessitate a borrowing and the financing cost to uh, to take that out during that life that would be paid for with ongoing uh, cash flow. So that basically makes up the project cost. Um, again, a chunk of that about 1.3 is administration and, and um, the uh, financing cost, but we've identified about $6.6 .6 million would be what we'd say would be eligible to relate the project cost if the district is in fact um, created. So the board can uh, go and see. So the, the second schedule in this is the, the development assumptions. And again, Vandewall worked uh, with the city and putting these together. We've kind of broken them out into different type of components. The uh, first column, as was mentioned, is the gas station up on the northern end of the, the district area. The second is a hotel, so it's expected that maybe construction on the gas station was to be starting yet this year. The hotel um, being constructed and completed in 2020. Uh, now some of that timing may adjust. There's some commercial lots as well up in that northern end that we've, we've put about $2 million of value assigned to that. And then the, the big thing in the longer duration of, of um, absorption and phasing is that manufacturing piece of that industrial piece, which is that northern section of the uh, entire district boundaries. And there's two, two lots that become pretty developable once that first phase goes in. Um, now, I've got lot numbers when you ultimately see this that ties to a schedule that Vandewalt did, so it's kind of reversed of what Bill's lot numbers are, but um, I did that so that I knew I was accounting for everything and finding it out properly. And then the second phase would be when the second extension of that the, uh, initial street goes in and the utilities. Um, we've kind of put for now a placeholder in 2024 where the development would start happening after that point in time. And then lastly, beginning in like 32 would be the, the last extension, and um, from 33 beyond would be the absorption of those lots. Again, this could certainly move faster, and that would be a great thing, but we didn't want to be too aggressive in our assumptions here. And again, the cost would be paced with the potential for the development of those sites. So hopefully uh, things would move um, faster than this, but that's how we feel it for now. So then the next phase of this is saying, okay, um, let's determine how much potential tax revenue would be generated on these improvements so we know if those tax revenues could support the cost that we've identified. So we take the development assumptions that we had in the previous schedule, we identify a construction year, bring that value in based upon construction. Under tax law, it's constructed one year, it's valued the next year, and the tax is collected on the following year. So we we built that in. So anything that's constructed in 2019, the first time you'll actually see taxes collected on that project <coughs> in 2021, when you're budgeting the 2021 budget. Now, we, um, at this point, are assuming once it's built, we're not assuming any appreciation on property, nor are we assuming any depreciation. So, uh, you know, manufacturing doesn't always appreciate as much as, if at all, as to some other commercial, but we're assuming nothing at this point, and we're holding the tax rate. Um, constant throughout the life of the district, so we're not you know, guessing that that would go up or down either. And our green column is ultimately our, our projection of the overall um, taxes based upon these assumptions uh, would be about $8.2 um, to $8.3 million dollars of taxes that would be collected, and then it's those dollars that will ultimately pay for um, the vast majority of the project costs. So um, what we've done here in terms of how these projects would be financed is as Tim mentioned, um, and Bill mentioned, there's been money set aside of about a million dollars, which I believe has been incorporated in the uh, 2019 budget. So that first phasing, you're not looking to do any capital borrowing for that. You've got cash on hand to do that. So we reflected that the project's coming in and the cash available as an advance to the TIF district. And you'll see as we go through the cash flow, it's the intent that the district will pay that money back um, some time in the future. Uh, then we've, we've structured debt issuances, and we've done it in a short-term financing of 10 years, no issues, which is, is usually the preference um, here at the city, in 2024 and 2032. And again, those borrowing and those costs would be undertaken if there's a potential for those sites to go, because you didn't want to borrow if you didn't expect it, the value to come online. So we've built debt issuances for those. Um, anything that's provided for um, uh, a development incentive, uh, and again, most likely that would be on the northern end of the district, would be done as what we call as a pay-as-you-go. 
where the, there's, in many of your tax increment districts now have those features. Uh, I think almost everything we've done in tax increment district number five for any improvements over the years was um, you provide assistance, but it's not up front. The building needs, the property needs to be improved and they collect it over time as, as part of that tax increment collection. So that's a very um, good way of doing that. It shifts the risk to the development and not um, the city. Then we've got ongoing projects which include the administrative and the financing costs. So the last piece is kind of pulling all this together because this is the hardest one to see, but basically walking through this schedule uh, from the left to the right is the first column is that budget year and the tax revenue collection. So I mentioned earlier anything constructed in 19, the first year will collect revenue is 2021. That's that $8.2 million of tax increment revenue projection. Uh, as with other funds on hand, they're invested. So any investment earnings on the balance in this fund would come to the district. We've, we've identified that. The next column is the million dollars that's being advanced from the city from other funds to help pay for that first run project cost. And then followed by that, the future years of bond proceeds where we're borrowing money to undertake the project cost. Now we've identified the two borrowings I mentioned earlier, um, one taking place in 24 and one place in 32. We're at this point, we're estimating the cost of uh, undertaking those projects. And um, then the, the pay go or that support to the developer, we've identified, um, and that's kind of based upon a value projection and, and some dollars that would potentially be provided through a, um, a pay go uh, over time contribution to a project. Then the, the remaining expenses are um, the issuance expenses on that, the debt financing. We've identified the project cost, and ultimately this number here agrees with the uh, city provided cost to do all the infrastructure. So those costs are paid for the revenues from these debt issues. Um, and then the advance, the, the million dollars from the city, would be recovered in that cash flow over time. So the city would get that, those funds back and they would be available for something in the future. And um, so the goal here is to make sure that that revenue stream of taxes covers basically making the debt service payments which are being borrowed to pay for the private cost. And will that recover itself within the 20 years life of this district um, as an industrial or a mixed use district? And our forecasting at this time says that at the point you've got enough, the debt is paid off, or there's funds on hand that are greater than the outstanding debt is in 2038, which is two years earlier than the district could potentially um, stay open. So assuming you did all the project costs and this absorbed in this fashion uh, in terms of development, this district would be a success. So we all know that um, we can't predict 20 years out and this will change. Timing of things may change. You may not do all the project costs. Um, once you commit to a project plan, it's not a commitment that you're going to spend the dollars. It's just a plan that's out there and it gives you the ability to take those project costs, finance and make tax increment financing. And the benefit to that is you're not just using your city dollars, is there's a sharing of those costs by the other taxing entities because you get the benefit of a full tax rate, not just the city's rate to undertake these projects. So um, a lot of information, I know a lot of numbers that I'm just uh, rattling through here, but I'm happy to answer any questions at this point. Uh, to the question you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, if you could go back to, uh, <coughs> uh, go, back, go back to the, uh, the slide that had uh, the, the different colors in the uh, full park. So, so just generally speaking, what Dawn was talking about, how uh, this district really develops over a 20-year period, that's what it would be. You know, the shaded areas is, you know, what we think would happen um, uh, with the green phase being 2019 and then future phases uh, occurring and they would time with your analysis that you did. Up in the, the northwest corner, up by the interchange, uh, that is really, really nice property. It has uh, really good access to the bypass, pretty highly visible. It just isn't improved. We have a lot of improvements up in that interchange area, but you know, it's a fair investment to expend, extend power, water, sewer uh, systems to uh, serve that property. But you know, one would have to generally say before you can expect development to occur, 
uh, at that location, you've got to make an investment and you've got to provide municipal services to it. So, um, you know, that's what we would hope to accomplish with a tax increment district. So I think our plan is, uh, unless there's a, really an objection, we would start the next step, which really is to take uh, the project into the statutory process, lots of meetings, uh, public hearing uh, along the way to try to have the district put in place uh, by February, I think is our timetable. And quite honestly, to make things like that industrial park expansion and even the projects up on the, uh, the, the northwest uh, portion, the gas station and the hotel, you need a pass <coughs> in the district. Or, you know, you just aren't going to be able to facilitate those types of projects. So um, that's what our plan is. That's what our, what our goal is. Tim, what about the parcel west of 26 and south of the auction? Would that be wise to include that or not? <clears throat> well, we, we could. That parcel is typically served. All the utilities are to the site. Uh, the only improvement that I could see, Toby, that that, that someday, might go quick. Someday probably would be needed is, you know, I think there's traffic signals. That's a signalized intersection at, at some point. Uh, when there's a traffic warrant, which really means sometime after development up there occurs and you have all the right traffic comes. But um, uh, it certainly could uh, be included. We didn't because the property is served right now with water and sewer. <clears throat> How do you access lot two? Okay. In the green area? Yes. You want to go ahead? Just talk well, about the... again, this was, when, when we laid this out, we typically, we had an idea as far as what lot one was going to be here for highway landscapers. Um, yeah. Lot two and lot three certainly could have access off of um, Dewey um, or we could potentially have a driveway come in off of uh, the extension of the road. Again, the planning is not set in set in stone. What I'm anticipating is that when we do the initial planning on this, we will likely have a four lot CSM that shows our roadway through here, our lot one. Um, everything north is probably going to be one lot and then possibly um, lot two and three, and we may just um, include a flag lot off of um, the road extension so that we can include a driveway off of uh, the road right, right through here. The main thing we wanted to do is say for a typical industrial lot that we are going to be seeing somewhere between five and eight acres, how many lots could we get off of it for a project plan? So I anticipate this will change, and what we'll do is make sure that we plant this in a manner that gives us the most flexibility so that if we do have any interest from a potential um, business that we can accommodate their needs. I mean, this could potentially be a single user depending on what somebody wanted to come in and do that as. So um, for the time being, we know that we're going to have some of those issues, but we just want to leave ourselves as flexible as we can until we have a potential uh, business that's interested in those areas. Thank you, John. Welcome. Welcome there. You going to take over? Okay. Okay. Well, we're we're just going to move it along. That took a little longer than I was thinking, and uh, uh, the uh, the next folks that um, we're going to hear from is uh, Mark and, and Jennifer from the medical college. You've probably been reading about uh, that in the newspaper uh, recently, and actually, uh, there was a time when the college was proposed to go up in that area that uh, we want to expand the industrial park. Uh, since that time, uh, they have switched locations. Um, that deal is in place uh, on county-owned property, a lovely piece of property on the uh, south southwest side of the community. Quite honestly, for this development, probably better than the city's 100 acres in terms of visibility. And uh, uh, Mark, I'm just going to turn it over to you and. Uh, 
You know, take as much time as you want, just don't go over 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> take your time, I'm kidding. How much I'm kidding. Do you do seven? <laughs> I'm kidding. Hi, everybody. Hello. Well, first of all, we want to thank the city for the uh, initial site upon which we conceived building the medical school. And to thank the leadership and the Common Council for their continuing belief in this project. And it's been extraordinary and we appreciate it. When we first thought about that 100 acres, we also actually thought about this site down the road in terms of the ultimate evolution of the college because we are beginning with a college of osteopathic medicine but we thought there would be a time when we would become <coughs> a college of allied health sciences and that we would aggregate other academic partners and potentially corporate partners to be engaged with the college. This site that we're currently going to be on, the county site, uh, holds great promise because of the size of the footprint. It allows not only for the college in its first iteration, but it allows for the expansion of the college as it grows. It also allows for the immediate uh, introduction of opportunities to academic partners and to corporate partners. When we wrote the application for the new market tax credits, we talked about a campus that would evolve into a research park. And that probably is exactly what we're talking about here, a footprint large enough to hold all of these opportunities. We were also challenged by initial funders that we talked with, philanthropists in Wisconsin who support other colleges, and they would say, this, this is your 100-year shot that uh, you need a footprint large enough to accommodate the growth that you're going to have as you move forward. So this is the plan. Bolt is still with us. They've been with us throughout this process. Uh, Tom Bolt came and spoke uh, at the county board meeting when this concept was uh, originally introduced and brought all of his enthusiasm and the ongoing commitment of their company uh, to the development of this site, which is is quite significant. It was important in the beginning. It's important now. Do you want to talk a little bit about the site? Sure. Maybe on So we started working with the county probably over a year ago, discussing the site. And at their December meeting, they unanimously approved uh, entering into a letter of intent regarding the site with the county. <coughs> So, um, this is preliminary. Obviously, just like the business park, it can change. But um, there have been uh, things that have already taken place as far as stormwater management and wetland delineation, etc. So, this is where we are starting from. This um, to the left hand side of 26 on this, on this schematic is something that we are talking about future future. So I know that is something that the Sioux County Supervisors were very concerned about. Um, that is way into the future. Anything here is we're talking about the county's expansion, all the county services currently exist here. This is um, mountain bike trails that were just put in this last year. This we're talking about low density residential housing. This is Collins up here. And so now we're talking about here's 26. This is there's already a turnoff for, for the college. These are roads that are going through. So the purple, periwinkle, are all what we're talking about college, college sites. It's about 75 acres as it sits right there. So the buildings that are in red, hot pink, are what we envision to be the initial buildings in the project. This is the main administration and teaching building for the osteopathic college. We initially talked about having some of the uh, a wellness center and a clinic on this side, but the more we thought about it, we're talking, this is looked at as a county park expansion, this is the potter's field that currently exists and will stay, obviously. And when I started thinking about that, we started talking about it, um, we need parking for this 
this county park, having the wellness center on this end allows you to build outside activities for people that take advantage of the wellness center. The free clinic site is across from where the free clinic is currently for the county, so that seemed to make a lot more sense than putting it down here. We're looking at this for future expansion, parking. These are also what are envisioned for future buildings as we talk about that College of Allied Health. And here we're talking, we have student housing available. That is something that's incredibly important as we've learned as we've gone through various discussions with different osteopathic colleges that currently exist. The aqua or stormwater, the green space will remain. We talked about maybe putting some sort of outdoor facility that students could use for lectures or the community could use for a community theater here. What we're trying to preserve is this visual path. Vis well, I was thinking gateway, but yes, yeah, gateway. this visual path from Highway 26 to the main campus of the college here. The hot pink, the Easter pink, <laughs> the Easter pink um, are the possible academic partners, whether they be corporations or um, the healthcare system. A healthcare system that would come in and um, surround the college and there then would provide a research firm. It's been true for the last four years, and it's even more true with this recent media coverage of this project, that boy is there interest. Uh, the next, really, year and, and beyond is involved in, in getting through our accreditation process. Part of that is also recruiting your faculty and beginning to set the storyline to get students to matriculate. We hear from faculty all over the country, distinguished faculty from all over the country, who are interested in coming to Jefferson to teach at this college. The American Osteopathic Association is excited that the upper middle west, the Midwest proper, which has been kind of bereft of osteopathic medical colleges, once you, know, you get beyond Des Moines, you get beyond Chicago, and the upper middle west so they're thrilled that uh, you know this footprint is coming in here so there's a lot of excitement there in terms of working with us around uh, accreditation so the enth having, enthusiasm of why i was going to say having highway 26 and the cutoff here was just a portion of why we were very interested in the site um, this site has been designated as one of two in jefferson county as economically distressed and it's now an opportunity zone, which were designated by the federal government. That's something that's new. In addition, we were uh, the college was invited to be on an application with WIDA for new market tax credits that would come from the United States Treasury. We were one of two projects that were picked in Jefferson County for that, and we will should be finding out actually in January whether the state of Wisconsin received any of those tax credits and how that funnels down to the different projects that were on there. You know, we've been talking from the beginning about this project being one where it follows this consortium funding model, which we've always used, and, you know, the mix of federal money, the, the mix of state money, the mix of private philanthropy. The New Market Tax Credits and the Economic Opportunity Zone opens this up to very socially aware investors who are both philanthropists but are also interested in the economic value that can be derived from getting behind it campus like this. So uh, the fact that we are kind of a double whammy, having both, uh, has uh, woken a few people up. Which a is, few people. Which is, which is, which is, is quite exciting. Are we under 10? Yes. Since we're under 10 for the new people in the room, I'll <coughs> your name. Can I find out who you are if you didn't mention names? Oh, sure. Um, I'm Jennifer, and the last name is D. Gray. It's D-E, capital K. R-E-Y, I live in Jefferson. Okay. My name is Mark Lafay. Good luck. <laughs> that one I know. Ooh, oh, I remember, uh, uh, I remember from the original story. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's, that's good. Thank so, you. So then, this is all county land. It's within the city limits. That's correct. So okay. there would need so, to be Created. Right. So, but none of those, I mean, interior roads exist. That's correct. Right. So that will eventually affect the city 
-hmm. to put in and you know, all that. Like we gotta really Just like you're doing with okay. the other one. Yep. Uh, it's my understanding that the county is not going to give the land. They're going to sell it to you at 10,000 an acre. Well, the current, the way the current letter of intent sits is that the college would buy it at $10,000, 10,000 an acre. This flat your part. The first 75 first acres. The first 75 acres. However, there will be some in incentives, economic incentives, um, if the college brings in that get my partner, for example, that purchases this lot and this lot then it's possible that the price to the college either could be refunded or reduced. And, and governance of this is seen as a collaboration <coughs> among city, the county and the county city and the college. college. So, <coughs> well, do you have some sort of option or right to buy these uh, additional uh, acreage? The, that is currently the, the letter of intent is the, the county's portion. We have certain things that we need to make sure that they are done by certain dates and the county is at a standstill. So stand still, do you think? A standstill mm -hmm. on doing anything else with the property oh, okay. until we, we met all of the criteria. Anything else? Thanks for the opportunity Thank you. to have a chat. Good luck. Thanks a lot, Mark. Yep. And Jennifer. Yeah. The uh, the next person I wanted to introduce, Ken. Why don't you come on up and uh, and uh, about a week ago at the plan commission, um, the uh, the folks that uh, have the we know it as the Excel building out on the west side of the community. Uh, the folks that have that property under contract to purchase came in and uh, shared their vision. Kent is actually, I think, the realtor uh, that is uh, representing these people. And actually, the PowerPoint we have queued up is the same one that you shared with the plane commission okay. last week. So, uh, Kent Yan. Yep. Oh, good evening. Um, I'm actually, I, I used to have a bench on this one, so I'm really kind of. Not the best things on this one, but um, new for construction. Um, they actually <coughs> came in from Madison to Cambridge, um, and uh, they're a family-owned company. And the father of the family really likes soccer. And so when we saw this up uh, for sale, probably a year ago now, we, uh, we looked at it and uh, thought, well, hey, it might work. Um, we could do the project there with that. Uh, you know, as you know, it's about an acre open shell of the building right now. And so, <clears throat> about maybe a little bit following, uh, the, the listing agent um, called us and said that you know, there might be an offer coming in, so we put an offer and we got it accepted, actually. And the idea that we have an offer is that we have to first secure it and close on it first, which we're working on, is to, rather than, uh, I think the original one kind of supposed to have a track and field and some baseball diamonds, uh, they actually want to put in the indoor soccer field, but still have the two well, the bigger basketball uh, court and then two smaller basketball courts as the original plan was. Mm -hmm. um, which now, we don't have any sub-tenants under that, and legal construction, not the construction company, but the ownership of it, but actually have their own separate entity to actually run the, uh, the basketball courts and the soccer fields as well. Um, there's about <coughs> roughly 10 to 12,000 square feet of remaining space that we were planning to white box and rent out to other businesses. One of which we have in Madison is a CrossFit uh, concept that one of the owners of Flamingo is actually friends with and he's kind of interested in coming with it. And then the other one, where we don't know that. Um, so all that is still in the works. We have to, of course, close on the, project, close on the property first before we can do anything. Uh, we have gotten estimates so far. Um, it's heading up to quite a bit, but um, Ideally, in a, in a, in a streamlined world, when the stars are aligning, the idea would be to come back in in the late spring, summertime, start construction, and hopefully have an opening around this time in 2019, pending mm -hmm. approvals and permits and all that fun stuff. So, still, it's, uh, it's all in the works right now, but ideally, it's the same thing that was going to happen, I think, was two years ago, was presented, or that it was built. Um, except that instead of a, you know, tracking field, it's more of a soccer field instead. This is the only main difference. And of course, 
the uh, in a 10,000 inch square feet of unknown right now of uh, what might be going in there. So there will be an owner occupant building with possible retail or office use or clinic use uh, in addition to that. So in a nutshell, that's what we're shooting for. When you project to uh, close? Hopefully in the next uh, week or so. Oh, good. But or, uh, just, uh, don't, don't, don't jinx us at least. <laughs> okay. uh, so we, uh, we're, we're working on it. Is, uh, so before the end of the year? Trying to. Trying to. I would just say too, as far as the process goes, um, again, they met in front of the Planning Commission last week. Um, the conditional use would transfer over when the, tra when the uh, uh, project closes. Uh, they will still be required to come back in front of the Planning Commission uh, with their own plans. Um, obviously, they can't use the existing plans that are out there, but um, they talked to us uh, having their own civil engineers, architects on site, uh, do their own plans. So um, the Planning Commission will be hearing more about this um, later in the spring, summer when they close on this. Um, so I just want to make sure people are aware they still have to go through that process, but they're well aware of that. So that's a full size soccer team? I don't know. Uh, I don't know the exact dimension of it. Uh, I don't know what areas. Yeah. Yeah. Now they're bigger than the football field. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Indoor, I was asking if you want to run it. Yeah, indoors a little bit different. But I think that's where it will be at. Uh, future plans possibly include like sitting in another building or something. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 Please repeat your name. Fence, K E N T. Yep. Last name, Yan. Y A N. Y A N. Got it. Thank you. All right, thank you much. <clears throat> Jim, come on up. So the, the next project we wanted to bring you up to date oh, on is I'm actually sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, property out near the golf course. Um, the property is owned by Jim Keen. Most of us know Jim. Um, generally speaking, I would say that uh, uh, most of the new development that's occurred out there is uh, within our tax increment district number seven been extremely successful if you do a tax increment district you want them to pretty much turn out uh, like they did here there was an investment in putting in rhino street and extending utilities but by and large uh, that was a good bet because the property developed created a fair amount of tax base that district uh, about two years ago uh, we expanded the boundaries to include about another five or six acres of property it's, yeah, it's generally, here's the clubhouses up here, mm -hmm. and um, we expanded the boundaries of the district by about this. And one of the things that we thought would occur, uh, and it's written in the project plan for that district, is that Gulf Drive would be extended to the south uh, to basically the edge of the tax increment district, and from that point on, the road would really be private and it goes through a piece of ground that runs right through the golf course uh, all the way from north to south basically and connects uh, on the south side into Clancy Street. And uh, if you know the piece of property, you know that it sits up high, it's a ridge with really beautiful views of the golf course. Jim's vision really has uh, always been to develop that for residential home sites or duplex properties. Um, a couple of months ago, uh, Jim had this preliminary uh, plat developed. It was approved by the Plan Commission. Uh, we anticipate in very early uh, 2019 that we would start the engineering process for what is the public piece of Gulf Drive and at the same time Jim would start the design engineering for what is the private uh, portion of Gulf Drive running down to Clancy. Um, and it's not just the street extension, you know, you, it's the full utility extensions, power, water, sewer. Uh, it's not cheap to do all that, um, but I think that's the goal. The city has a shortage of housing. 
and uh, this is one project that we think would be really, really desirable. And uh, Jim, I'll, I'll let you spend a few minutes chatting. Yeah. yeah. Up here, uh, Tuesday night, I met with some people, a guy that wants to put up a RCAC apartment building, 40 units up there on the golf course. And we'll overlook the golf course. It's right next to them condos I put up up there. And uh, I think I'll talk to you guys a little bit about it, but we're hoping uh, we'll have some plans up by sometime next month. I was talking. Peter West is going to do the architectural work for these gentlemen. They own them two uh, CBRFs in the down there. They, they're out of, uh, one's out of Persigny, the other one's out of uh, Sheboygan up there. They're very, very, very interested in coming in here. So, and uh, the right here is where like, the, uh, this is what we're going to call uh, a private drive through here. Oh, this is going to be no curb and gutter, no sidewalks, but we're going to make the road wider and we're going to put cart path on the road so if anybody's in there has got a golf cart to be back on the road. And it's a 66 foot lane in there. Now with this being up here, if we get these people up here, there's a 65, 35, 65% has got to be res uh, business, 35% residential. So that's why I'd make this tip district bigger. Now that I, if I get this in here, now this all becomes residential. So I'll get a neighbor. <coughs> yeah, call more lots up there. So we're gonna, we got some other expansions. We got a good enough, I gotta put another, parking lot in here and stuff like that up there, so, yeah. Are you Another anticipating reason? this is going to be a combination of duplex and single family? Yeah, yeah. Condos, yeah. I've mean, got some very nice lots up here. These are beautiful lots up here. Oh, oh, everyone, everyone, every one of the lots bought up to the golf course. Every one of the lots. You know, I got, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure how we're going to build them, but we're going to stick in a slab, put them on a slab. Some of you want to be in the basement, some of the exposed basements. So, because all this in here, if you go up there, this all, it's like a crown like this here, you can put exposed basements all the way around here. So, so typically what, what happens with this is uh, the, the property gets into design engineering. Uh, once that's ready, Jim would come back, uh, would ask the plan commission to approve a final plan of subdivision. Um, and then kind of the next step in the process is to bid the project out to start the physical construction of the street and you know, utilities. And my guess, Jim, you know, uh, it may very well occur in uh, phases. Otherwise, you're spending a ton of money creating a huge inventory more than can be absorbed in our market. So I think probably this happens more in, uh, in, in, in phases. And tell him, Tim, you, you, I know the, the city is going to loop the water around for me on that whole project up there. So it starts way up, starts way back here, and loops it all the way around. Here comes all that. It's like almost 4,000 lineal feet of, uh, of roadway and, and uh, sewer water and stuff like that. So. Thank you. Good job. Thank you, Jim. The, uh, the next project we wanted to uh, talk a little bit about, and Cindy, um, um, you're going to handle this one, is really a city project that um, we are involved with Jefferson County. Pretty, pretty unique project. Um, we are combining our efforts. We do have an intergovernmental agreement and we want to develop a portion of what we all know as the former county highway shop property. And the portion that I'm talking about is the river frontage, uh, most of which sits in the floodplain, so it's not like you can promote uh, the development of private improvements along that stretch of property. Uh, when we last talked about this in September, I think we said we had written uh, two grants, uh, the city did, um, and Cindy can tell you about the status of those. And, uh, but we anticipate uh, if the funding comes through that um, this is going to be a 2019 project. We'll talk about the timetable after we've done Cindy. Um, yeah, so like Tim said, we have an intergovernmental agreement with Jefferson County on this. Um, they're the property owners. They're the property owners. So this would be the first city county park. Um, so we're kind of excited about that. We did write two grants. The first one was a recreational boating grant 
we did receive notification that we did receive that grant. It's a 50% match at $58,700. That grant typically is actually to do the trailer, and I'll kind of use this, might be a little easier. It's going to be for the trailer parking and the boat launch along with the public piers. So that project will be just this section. Um, then we did write a stewardship grant, and in order to submit the grant, we needed to make sure that we had both our DNR and our Army Corps of Engineer permits. We have now since received those permits. Um, we did get notice that the stewardship grant um, has been received with some caveats. Uh, because it's over a $250,000 threshold, it has to go to the Joint Committee on um, Joint Committee on Finance at the state level in order to approve. So we're they are about to we're going to receive a $434,000 grant if the Joint Committee approves it. Um, and because of the election and everything like that, they opted not to take our request to the Joint Committee until after January 7th. So once the new committee gets on place, then they will have a 14-day passive review period. In that review period, they can decide if they want to approve it or if they want to take it on to a public hearing. So if they take it to a public hearing, then we'll be asking the mayor and um, some of the city council to go to joint finance on our behalf. <laughs> okay, well. So what happens next? If the Joint Committee of Finance approves, then we can start to sign our grant contracts and we can move forward. Um, the county has a contract with R.A. Smith already for, they procured them for their engineering work. So we will have R.A. Smith begin our engineering work for the park process. Um, we will be in conversations with the county to amend the intergovernmental agreement and the reason for that is that there's things in that agreement that we still need to talk about. As far as, we've talked about this, the county will own it, the city will do the day-to-day -day maintenance, but there's other little details in there that we want to work on. The total co cost of this project is a $1.1 million project. Um, this is going to be a great thing for our city, and it's right on the river. It, this park is going to be a, a nice passive park. We'll have trailheads, parking, and it's really going to help spur the private development because we feel that if you have a developer come in, they're going to want, this is a huge asset for them. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, the city is going to build a, a, the road adjacent to the park. This will be our section right in here to build. Um, monies for this have been appropriated already with the TIG number five fund. Um, project and um, we will be doing all because we applied for the grants we will be doing all the grant administration on this i thank you cindy and i, I think that um it really is a great project really taking a piece of property where there has been no public access for literally a hundred years and um, uh, you're going to create public access uh, in a piece of property, you really can't do much because it sits within the floodplain, and uh, I think really that's why it scored so well. Plus, the fact it's really close to downtown, and you know, has that residual uh, benefit as well. And I think Cindy's right, and uh, just having spoken with a number of developers, that the idea to develop the rest of the old Cone Highway Shop property. You're really light years ahead if we can figure out how to put uh, a park along the waterfront portion of that property. But that is our goal. Uh, we intend really to start that process along with the county in 2019 and ideally by the conclusion of next year uh, really have phase one of uh, the project completed. Cindy, before we just move on, I'm going to ask you just to talk a little bit about what is really phase one and three? I'm going to hold this up. So, um, phase one of the park will include the boat launch, the trailer parking, um, public piers. We'll also be putting in this parking lot, um, 
and the, the public street will be the main phase one, and then we will be putting in for the grant will be all the grass areas and the restroom facilities as well. So. Will the uh, river walk uh, ever be connected to this park at some time? point? Um, at this point, currently the plan is to do an on-street connection, but it would be nice if we could. Jennifer. You said the total cost of the project is about $1.112 million. Mm -hmm. um, you've got roughly 500000 secured in the grants you're hoping. Where is the additional funding coming from? Um, that money is coming. Some of it is for um, the, uh, the match will be through the county and through mm -hmm. Force Account Number. What was the last? Force Account, meaning they'll be working on helping like grading and things like that. And essentially, it's match funds between yeah. the, uh, okay. the city and the county. Have to match so, in other words, city the, and county uh, help. Great, thanks. Um, there's just a couple more projects we want to talk about before uh, we get to go home. Um, the next one is probably my personal favorite project, and it's only because I've worked on it for about three and a half years. That is um, the idea uh, to take the old foremost buildings property and convert it to approximately 36 uh, historic dwelling units. The developer that we've been working with that has the property under control uh, and hopes to close by about the latter point of a part of summer is uh, the Gorman uh, Companies, pretty large developer, uh, no neophyte. Uh, they do these types of complex projects fairly frequently uh, throughout Wisconsin and really the Midwest. Um, where they take old industrial properties uh, and they try to convert them to uh, multi-family dwellings. So this one is extremely unusual in that um, the redevelopment authority starting the process about three years ago um, started to do work to determine whether the property would be eligible for the state and federal register of historic places. And lo and behold, uh, it was. Uh, the property was nominated. That work's been done. It is on the state and federal registers. And it's really not due to architectural uniqueness, uh, but because this is really the last of, uh, I think there were five separate companies that uh, comprised uh, the Schweiger Manufacturing uh, Company. This is the last remaining building of historical significance. The rest have been lost uh, over time. Um, so, and of course, I, I think most people would argue that that company was uh, contributed significantly to the development of the community. Um, and so uh, that really is the reason that um, um, it got added. Bill, if you uh, just advance us. I can tell you to do this, it's really, really expensive. It is impossible in <coughs> small markets like our communities to do these projects unless you get lots of help. And uh, I really have to commend Gorman. They've been at this for a long, long time. Uh, they've assembled about $9.7 million to uh, convert this property from a variety of sources. I mean, you're stacking capital on top of capital to do this. And I'll just take you um, real quickly through these. These funding sources are approved. They are in place. The first one where it says LIHPC, uh, those are tax credits that are awarded competitively from WIDA, uh, a state department um, um, level agency. The value of those are just a little under $5 million. Those credits are awarded. A company like Gorman takes those credits and they sell them typically for about 60 to 70 cents on the dollar and that's money they bring into projects like this. Um, in return, they have to take a number of those units and set them aside for affordable housing. So in this case, a minimum of eight of the 36 units 
will be a set, set aside for affordable housing, which typically is defined at about 80% of median income in, in Jefferson County. Uh, the next line, federal, state, historic tax credits, because it is on the federal and state registers, a portion of the project is eligible for a pretty nice tax credit. The value of that is about $2.6 million. Uh, WIDA will be holding the first mortgage in the amount of about $415,000. FHLB is the Federal Home Loan Bank from Chicago. Through a competitive pro uh, process, they were awarded about $600,000. Um, Gorman is deferring their development fee of $221,000. The City of Jefferson previously approved a $500,000 loan. I would term that as favorable uh, terms. Um, from its affordable housing fund. The city has a fund that uh, it can use these monies only specifically to promote affordable housing. We've been saving those for quite some time for a project like this. This was the project. And then lastly, uh, and just recently, uh, the Home Consortium, which Jefferson <coughs> County participates along with Waukesha, Ozaki, and Washington uh, County awarded state home funds to this project. Uh, that's a loan in the amount of $500,000. Uh, the $9.7 million number at the bottom on the total columns, that's the cost to basically repurpose the building as it stands now into approximately 36 uh, historic apartment units. That money is in place. What is not in place that I'm gonna talk about right now is a portion of this building sits within the Rock River floodplain. Cuts through uh, a corner of the building, but by virtue of uh, just a small portion being in the floodplain, it basically takes the whole building and uh, treats it as non-conforming. That has to be dealt with before this project uh, uh, can proceed. Um, one of the things that makes this a little different from projects like the Jefferson Area Business Center on the other side of the river or Heron's Landing, where those buildings were in the floodplain or significant parts of those buildings were in the floodplain, the lower elevations were filled in basically to elevate above the floodplain level. We can't really do this because the whole first floor of this building is proposed to be indoor parking. Right, they're really good amenity in our climate, so you can't fill it in. So the way that we've worked this through with the DNR is basically to remove the property from the floodplain by putting a levee system around the property. Not done too often in this community, but if this is done, uh, it would remove the property from the floodplain forever. Probably a pretty good thing. It's just expensive to do that. It's about a half a million dollars that really has not been accounted for. So if you want to add that to the 9.7, you're talking over a $10 million uh, project. That's what we are working on now. Bill, I don't know if you can get the video uh, to play, but the uh, levy is a combination uh, sheet pile and earthen uh, levy burning <coughs> systems. Tim, what is the taxes going to be on that thing? Property taxes. Um, um, I would say, Jim, um, you know, it's it's not an increase of uh, nine or ten million dollars of tax base, and that's because of the tax credits. But I think, you know, generally it would be two and a half million dollars, something like that. That would be a larger taxpayer in, in the community when the project's complete. You're going to charge 10 million bucks if you couldn't even afford to live there. Did we run to it? Yeah. Oh, we did. Okay. So um, I just want to cover this ground really, really quickly. Uh, the project needs uh, an additional half million dollars. So uh, the strategy is that uh, a couple of nights ago at the council meeting, they did authorize uh, the city to submit on behalf of the project a grant application to WEDC, WEDAC, in the amount of $250,000.
for what's called a uh, community development investment grant. Uh, that's not alone, it's just a grant. It's a process we have to go through. We anticipate um, submitting that sometime before the end of this year. Um, the city uh, also increased uh, its housing loan from half a million to $650,000. We have those funds on hand. Um, and then the last $100,000 is assumed by the Gorman Company. So um, if we get the grant, and we may not know for a little bit, um, that's the last piece I think we're waiting on. So the one thing I would say, if you go back to that, if you look at that uh, LIHTC equity, those tax credits, the key for this project to happen is the project needs to be completed by December 31st of 2020. If it is not, those tax credits go away. Um, they're competitively awarded uh, by WIDA. And I can tell you, if the project loses those credits, you're not doing this project. <laughs> you know, that's a big source of funding. So our goal is um, to try to put everything in place for this project to start uh, mid-summer of 2019, and then it will take about 18 months to complete. Uh, so the goal is to have it complete, an occupancy certificate issued by uh, December 31st of 2020. So that is our goal. The other thing that I would say that's a little bit beyond our control is um, getting a piece of property out of the floodplain is a process that involves FEMA. And so right now uh, that berm has been engineered. The application has been submitted by Gorman. Uh, we're about in the middle of a six month re review period by FEMA. Uh, but we're encouraged because the DNR is supporting that application and um, you know the goal is to take the property out of the floodplain. We just need to work it through, uh, but uh, for the project to advance, in addition to the additional money I just talked about, we need FEMA to approve that application so that uh, at its completion, when the levy is constructed, the property is taken out of uh, the floodplain by virtue of basically amending the floodplain maps for uh, that piece of property in the city. But um, this is a fun one, pretty significant. Um, someone asked about uh, the river walk. Part of the goal of this is we want to extend the river walk from Rotary <coughs> Park, complicated, along the river, cantilevering out over the water to this site, which is just north of uh, the Highway 18 bridge. And once we get to the property, we want to extend the river walk on an easement that we would get from Gorman between the levee wall and the water's <coughs> edge up to, the, up to West Candy Street. And from there, we would need about two blocks of surface street over Elizabeth Street, but then it gets you to that county highway uh, property park that Cindy talked about, and that has a trail system. And so the goal is to really, in the next couple of years, really be able to extend uh, the city's river walk system in a pretty meaningful, pretty meaningful way. Um, but that is the goal. Um, uh, any questions that you have? I think we have one or two more projects that we'll mention, and then it's going to be time to go home. Yes. Just real quick, um, would it be possible to approach the, the owner of the property between the park and this project and talk about possibly putting that walk through that backyard here property of this. I think it um, would be. Uh, that might be a good suggestion. Um, also, um, I know, I think he owns Jefferson Glass Company. I think you're right. I don't know if his property is zoned residential or business, but I live right across the street and mm -hmm. there's trucks there every day and he's putting mm -hmm. windows in his garage. Mm -hmm. So it's being used as a business and residential. Might want to approach it. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much. Yep, that gets us up to the city's bolt launch on yes. the Street. Yep. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? The last project uh, I'm going to have Bill mention, and then I have one more thing for the council I have to ask you. But you go ahead, Bill. Why don't you 
handle the next one. I'll just mention this at the last planning commission meeting uh, last week. <coughs> we had uh, O'Reilly Auto. Uh, they've been interested in Jefferson for several years. Uh, they looked at a couple different sites and they've settled in on the uh, uh, former Ace uh, Punzel building. Um, and last week at the planning commission, the site plan was approved for this. Um, essentially, they're going to be using the exact same building footprint. Um, the parking lot, they are going to be doing some uh, improved drainage and resurfacing that lot. Um, as far as timing on that, we were not providing any timing on that. The uh, city or the civil engineer did um, indicate that uh, um, just kind of gave us an update as far as coming to town. Certainly excited to be here. But at this point, we don't have a timing on this. But I do understand that they have closed on the building um, and the site plan is approved. So other than um, they're done, done with their local approvals other than anything they need to do through the building inspector. So I would anticipate that uh, we will start to see some things uh, coming through here. They will have to come back one more time and provide a signage plan, but uh, this will be certainly a, a welcome um, investment in the community here as well. Uh, you welcome uh, O'Reilly Auto. Last project I would uh, mention, uh, I won't name any names, but um, more likely than not, there is a residential, I'm sorry, a commercial uh, project uh, the first quarter of next year that will get in front of probably the plan commission and the council, maybe the RDA, I don't think so, uh, down near the Tyson store on the south end of the community, uh, probably involve a uh, minimum of two users. Um, I've mentioned that. And then lastly, I was hoping, uh, Council, that this would be the last meeting of 2018 that I would have to ask you, uh, but I think I have to ask you to meet next week on Thursday at 5 o'clock, and I'm just going to describe this really generally. Um, the, I don't know, Toby, what do we call this? It's the Huntington First Merit Citizens Salt Default Bank. Bank. The Default. Default Bank. Um, is under contract. The closing is scheduled to happen. It's for a commercial reuse, office reuse. There is a problem with the right of way that the council would need to take the action. Uh, the idea is for uh, the buyer to close before the end of the year. We're running out of time, but I think we would all say this is a good user. It's really good to have that building uh, fixed. I'm guessing uh, Mr. Rogers will uh, be able to run us in and out for 15 minutes or so. There is a fix for this. Uh, it is a little complicated, but uh, I guess I wanted to ask you uh, about your availability to me next week, Thursday, 5 o'clock for maybe 15 minutes. And that would put the local buyer in a position to close. Will this be closed session? I don't think so. No, no, I, no I, don't, I don't. I don't. I don't think so, Jim. A anyone not able to make it, Council? I know who's here. Yep. No idea. Okay. All right. Well, that'll be the that'll be the plan. We'll uh, we'll get an agenda out, but I think that one would be good, and I think you'll be pretty pleased what the uh, who the purchaser is and the, the reuse of uh, that. Would be the twenty seventh. And with that, Dale, I think uh, we can be finished and uh, we're going to be around. Anyone has any questions? Otherwise, I can adjourn. So move. So move.